Book Three, Chapter Three of Resurrection. In spite of the hard conditions in which they were placed, life among the political prisoners seemed very good to Katusha after the depraved, luxurious, and effeminate life she had led in town for the last six years, and after two months' imprisonment with criminal prisoners. The fifteen to twenty miles they did per day, with one day's rest after two days' marching, strengthened her physically, and the fellowship with her new companions opened out to her a life full of interests such as she had never dreamed of. People so wonderful, as she expressed it, as those whom she was now going with, she had not only never met, but could not even have imagined. There now, and I cried when I was sentenced, she said. Why, I must thank God for it all the days of my life. I have learned to know what I never should have found out else. The motives she understood easily and without effort that guided these people, and being of the people, fully sympathized with them. She understood that these persons were for the people and against the upper classes, and though themselves belonging to the upper classes, had sacrificed their privileges, their liberty, and their lives for the people. This especially made her value and admire them. She was charmed with all the new companions, but particularly with Mary Pavlovna. And she was not only charmed with her, but loved her with a peculiar, respectful, and rapturous love. She was struck by the fact that this beautiful girl, the daughter of a rich general, who could speak three languages, gave away all that her rich brother sent her, and lived like the simplest working girl, and dressed not only simply but poorly, paying no heed to her appearance. This trait, and a complete absence of coquetry, was particularly surprising and therefore attractive to Maslova. Maslova could see that Mary Pavlovna knew, and was even pleased to know, that she was handsome, and yet the effect her appearance had on men was not at all pleasing to her. She was even afraid of it, and felt an absolute disgust to all love affairs. Her men companions knew it, and if they felt attracted by her, never permitted themselves to show it to her, but treated her as they would a man. But with strangers, who often molested her, the great physical strength on which she prided herself stood her in good stead. It happened once, she said to Katusha, that a man followed me in the street, and would not leave me on any account. At last I gave him such a shaking that he was frightened and ran away. She became a revolutionary, as she said, because she felt a dislike to the life of the well-to-do from childhood up, and loved the life of the common people, and she was always being scolded for spending her time in the servants' hall, in the kitchen or the stables, instead of the drawing-room. And I found it amusing to be with the cooks and the coachmen, and dull with our ladies and gentlemen, she said. Then, when I came to understand things, I saw that our life was altogether wrong, I had no mother, and I did not care for my father, and so when I was nineteen I left home and went with a girlfriend to work as a factory hand. After she left the factory she lived in the country, then returned to town and lived in a lodging, where they had a secret printing press. There she was arrested and sentenced to hard labour. Mary Pavlovna said nothing about it to herself, but Katusha heard from others that Mary Pavlovna was sentenced because— when the lodging was searched by the police, and one of the revolutionists fired a shot in the dark, she pleaded guilty. As soon as she had learned to know Mary Pavlovna, Katusha noticed that, whatever the conditions she found herself in, Mary Pavlovna never thought of herself, but was always anxious to serve, to help someone, in matters small or great. One of her present companions, Novodvorov, said of her that she devoted herself to philanthropic amusements, and this was true. The interest of her whole life lay in the search for opportunities of serving others. This kind of amusement had become the habit, the business of her life, and she did it all so naturally that those who knew her no longer valued but simply expected it of her. When Maslova first came among them, Mary Pavlovna felt repulsed and disgusted. Katusha noticed this. But she also noticed that, having made an effort to overcome these feelings, Mary Pavlovna became particularly tender and kind to her. 
the tenderness and kindness of so uncommon a being touched maslova so much that she gave her whole heart and unconsciously accepting her views could not help imitating her in everything this devoted love of katusha touched mary pavlovna in her turn and she learned to love katusha these women were also united by the repulsion they both felt to sexual love the one loathed that kind of love having experienced all its horrors the other never having experienced it looked on it as something incomprehensible and at the same time as something repugnant and offensive to human dignity End of Book Three, Chapter Three. Book Three, Chapter Four of Resurrection. Mary Pavlovna's influence was one that Maslova submitted to because she loved Mary Pavlovna. Simonson influenced her because he loved her. Everybody lives and acts partly according to his own, partly according to other people's ideas. This is what constitutes one of the great differences among men. To some, thinking is a kind of mental game. They treat their reason as if it were a flywheel without a connecting strap, and are guided in their actions by other people's ideas, by custom or laws, while others look upon their own ideas as the chief motive power of all their actions, and always listen to the dictates of their own reason and submit to it accepting other people's opinions only on rare occasions and after weighing them critically simonson was a man of the latter sort he settled and verified everything according to his own reason and acted on the decisions he arrived at when a schoolboy he made up his mind that his father's income made as a paymaster in government office was dishonestly gained and he told his father that it ought to be given to the people when his father, instead of listening to him, gave him a scolding, he left his father's house, and would not make use of his father's means. Having come to the conclusion that all the existing misery was a result of the people's ignorance, he joined the socialists, who carried on propaganda among the people, as soon as he left the university and got a place as a village schoolmaster. He taught and explained to his pupils and to the peasants what he considered to be just, and openly blamed what he thought unjust. He was arrested and tried. During his trial he determined to tell his judges that his was a just cause for which he ought not to be tried or punished. When the judges paid no heeds to his words, but went on with the trial, he decided not to answer them, and kept resolutely silent when they questioned him. He was exiled to the government of Archangel. There he formulated a religious teaching which was founded on the theory that everything in the world was alive, that nothing is lifeless, and that all the objects we consider to be without life or inorganic are only parts of an enormous organic body which we cannot compass. A man's task is to sustain the life of that huge organism and all its animate parts. Therefore he was against war, capital punishment, and every kind of killing, not only of human beings, but also of animals. Concerning marriage, too, he had a peculiar idea of his own. He thought that increase was a lower function of man, the highest function being to serve the already existing lives. He found a confirmation of his theory in the fact that there were phacocytes in the blood. Celibates, according to his opinion, were the same as phacocytes, their function being to help the weak and the sickly particles of the organism. From the moment he came to this conclusion, he began to consider himself as well as Mary Pavlovna as phacocytes, and to live accordingly, though as a youth he had been addicted to vice. His love for Katusha did not infringe this conception, because he loved her platonically, and such love, he considered, could not hinder his activity as a phacocyte but acted, on the contrary, as an inspiration. Not only moral, but also most practical questions, he decided in his own way. He applied a theory of his own to all practical business, had rules relating to the number of hours for rest and for work, to the kind of food to eat, the way to dress, to heat and light up the rooms. With all this, Simonson was very shy and modest, and yet, when he had once made up his mind, 
nothing could make him waver. And this man had a decided influence on Maslova through his love for her. With a woman's instinct, Maslova very soon found out that he loved her, and the fact that she could awaken love in a man of that kind raised her in her own estimation. It was Nekhludoff's magnanimity and what had been in the past that made him offer to marry her, but Simonson loved her such as she was now, loved her simply because of the love he bore her, and she felt that Simonson considered her to be an exceptional woman, having peculiarly high moral qualities. She did not quite know what the qualities he attributed to her were, but in order to be on the safe side, and that he should not be disappointed in her, she tried with all her might to awaken in herself all the highest qualities she could conceive, and she tried to be as good as possible. This had begun while they were still in prison, when on a common visiting day she had noticed his kindly dark blue eyes gazing fixedly at her from under his projecting brow. Even then she had noticed that this was a peculiar man, and that he was looking at her in a peculiar manner, and had also noticed a striking combination of sternness. The unruly hair and the frowning forehead gave him this appearance, with the childlike kindness and innocence of his look. She saw him again in Tomsk, where she joined the political prisoners. Though they had not uttered a word, their looks told plainly that they had understood one another. Even after that, they had had no serious conversation with each other, but Maslova felt that when he spoke in her presence his words were addressed to her, and that he spoke for her sake, trying to express himself as plainly as he could. But it was when he started walking with the criminal prisoners that they grew specially near to one another. End of chapter 4 of Book 3